Good morning, Dr. Altman.
Hal Hoffman. This is Len Altman. I see you just signed on. Do you hear me? I do. Thanks so much, Len. How are you? Good, good. Um, so our audience is uh, growing. We got a couple of minutes here, so I think the next order of business is to put your slides up. Got it. Okay. All right. Perfect. Yeah, I see them. Good. And you can hear me all right? I hear you fine. You hear me? Yes. Good. good. And yeah, we always wait a few minutes uh, to get everyone to sort of have their last minute sign on. So uh, the talk's probably about 40 minutes. So we have plenty of time and uh, leave some time for questions too. Okay. Good. I'll just. Uh... At about seven, I'll just get you started. Well, I've got seven o'clock, so it's okay. So as you can see from this first slide, our presenter today is Hal Hoffman from uh, UC San Diego on inflammasomes and related diseases. I sort of guess my only comment on this would be when I was in training, no one had yet invented the name inflammasomes and the only diseases that we knew about, and we didn't know to call them that, were probably gout and familial Mediterranean fever. We didn't know what exactly caused them, but we now know. So we'll get a much uh, more complete answer right now. Go ahead. Great, thank you so much, Lynn. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, I always love talking about this group of diseases. Um, as you probably know, um, I'm an allergist immunologist. Uh, I did my uh, fellowship training in San Diego, and it was there that I um, uh, became interested in this group of diseases because of this one patient um, that I met during my fellowship, um, and uh, and have just continued to, to have an interest in, in that over the years, in addition to a lot of other um, rare diseases as well. Um, so let's see if I can get started there. Um, so I do have some disclosures. Um, I've uh, worked over the years with a number of different companies um, and done a little bit of consulting and speaking for them. Um, most of the companies I've worked with are um, make or, or have wanted to make um, drugs that are in this space. Um, I won't be talking specifically about, um, in a large part about any of these particular drugs, um, but it really is a situation where we couldn't have gotten where we are without a, a close working relationship with academic folks who are, who are doing a lot of the, the basic research and the, and the folks that were actually making, making drug and making it available. Um, so it's a really um, nice example of that relationship. But probably the most important disclosure for you um, is that I'm a surfer. So during this talk, you're gonna have to look at pictures of me surfing all over the world. And I'm about to leave this week for Nicaragua. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so we'll get started. Learning objectives, you guys all know. Um, uh, the goal is to sort of 
go away with a, a better understanding of what the inflammasome is and what those diseases that are related to the inflammasome are, um, and then how we potentially target them uh, now and also in the future. Uh, but I'll start with a case, um, and that case is, um, uh, as I mentioned, the, the patients that I met during my fellowship. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, how these diseases are defined and a little bit about the genetics of these disorders, because um, it was really that that, that got us to, to, to the um, understanding of the mechanisms and that being related to what um, to the inflammasome. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the structure and function of the inflammasome. We'll talk about um, the monogenic disorders that are related to the inflammasome. Uh, in the end, talk a little bit about some of the complex diseases and also about um, some of the um, old treatments and new treatments that are coming up in the future. Um, I think we'll probably do questions at the end. Uh, there will be time for questions. Um, I think uh, you know probably the best thing is to use the chat um, and we can sort of cover those um, in the end. Um, if you have a burning question, I also am not uh, opposed to stopping as well. <laughs> um, so uh, again, uh, this is a patient that I met during my fellowship. I'm pediatric trained, but um, one of the, uh, the interesting things about being an allergist is we get to see adults at the same time. And it's the perfect feel for this because we see families and this is exactly what, what, I, what I got involved with. So this guy came to us um, with a, a kind of boring um, history. I mean, not, not totally boring, but for an allergist, we're, we're used to hearing weird stories about patients with rashes and strange triggers. Um, this guy came, um, you know, with a cold-induced rash, and when I looked at the chief complaint, I was like, "Ah, I got this. This is cold urticaria." Um, but um, there was a different story. I mean, yeah, he did have, you know, this kind of urticaria-like rash, um, but it wasn't the same because he described this sort of almost daily pattern, um, oftentimes starting in the afternoon or evening, and it didn't seem to be touching cold. It seemed to be actually just a generalized cold exposure, like going outside on a cool day or going into an air-conditioned room. Um, if he totally stayed warm during the day and didn't get any cold exposure at all, he actually had very little or no symptoms. Um, the rash he described as itchy sometimes, but mostly what he described was painful um, and tender and, and burning, and actually at times really uncomfortable. Um, and he'd been seen by a number of different um, physicians over the time and, and had been treated with antihistamines and really said it took the edge off things. Sometimes it helped him to go to bed, but didn't really help much like we see with many of our patients that have urticaria. Um, the other really interesting thing about this story is he said he'd been dealing with this since birth. Um, and, uh, and that's very unusual for, um, for, for any kind of a urticarial process or, or cold urticaria. Um, the other thing is he had a lot of other symptoms, including low-grade fevers um, that he didn't really notice that much. He mostly noticed the chills. Um, he also would get um, a limb pain. Um, occasionally, he would get um, something where he'd actually been described as having gout. Um, he got this sort of foot, very painful foot swelling. He'd get these um, red eyes that were really painful. Um, and if you can imagine that if every time you went out a little bit and got a little bit of cold exposure or went into an air-conditioned building for a while, um, you got sick, it would pretty much turn you into a hermit. And that's kind of what he had done. He'd sort of learned what he had to do to, 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 to deal with the cold exposure and tried to limit his exposure as much as possible and always was sort of in dread of that sort of if he, if he ended up having a bad attack. Um, he'd also been uh, treated with steroids in the past um, to see if it would help. And it, it may have helped a little bit, but he decided that he'd rather deal with the, the disease and control of the disease and actually deal with the side effects of, of taking steroids. Um, he had had some labs done. Um, he had a, a white count that was a little bit elevated, you know, like 12,000, you know, uh, but He'd had some labs from ER visits where he'd been seen for really severe episodes where they'd gone up to 20 or 30,000. He also had a little bit of anemia and thrombocytosis that sort of indicated maybe chronic inflammation that, that went along with the SED rate, the CRP and the ferritin that were all just a little elevated, not you know crazy like we see in, in significant infections or really bad autoimmune disease. Um, and also he'd been seen by our um, rheumatologist and had a full panel of autoantibodies and didn't have anything show up that, that um, uh, that made them think autoimmune disease. Skin biopsy um, on the guy did look like urticaria in some ways. If you look at this, the epidermis is on the top, the dermis is on the bottom, um, just as a little bit of a reminder. Um, what you see in the bottom, which is urticaria-like, is you see all that white, and that basically is edema, dermal edema, and that's just the fluid that, that causes that raised lesion that we see in patients with hives. 
And normally a biopsy on a patient with hives is really boring. You just see that dermal edema and there's nothing else. But this guy had an interesting feature and that is he had neutrophils um, in the dermis. So it's called neutrophilic urticaria, neutrophilic dermatosis, which we'll sometimes see in chronic urticaria patients and really never in, in cold urticaria patients um, or classic cold urticaria patients. All right, so what about family history? Well, he'd said he'd gotten this since birth. Um, he actually wasn't that worried about himself. Um, he, he said he'd been to lots of doctors. He'd kind of given up on the idea of ever finding um, any kind of a treatment for this. Um, but he was there because um, his daughter had the exact same problem um, and she'd lived with this her whole life. But the main reason he showed up is he had this granddaughter that had been suffering um, for a few years. And he wanted to see if there's something he could do to try to figure out um, something to give her a better life than what he and, uh, and, and, uh, and the kid's uh, uh, mom had, had been through. So here's the pedigree. And I don't know how many pedigrees you guys draw in your clinic, but they basically handed this to me. They had like completely formally figured it out. Um, they knew names of everybody back into the 1700s, um, which is super unusual for American uh, families. And I think one of the reasons they could do this is they're a colonial American family. They actually did know the guy that came over from England in the 16 or 1700s. Um, and while it was a little unclear, those you know first four generations or so who actually had it and who didn't, um, it was, uh, um, very clear um, uh, the last four generations um, sort of who had it and who didn't because they'd really spent a lot of time figuring out who had this disease and who actually ended up giving it to them. Um, so here's our guy. Here's his, uh, his daughter and his granddaughter. Um, and if you look at this pedigree, it's a classic autosomal dominant um, pedigree. So what that means is you um, don't see any skipping of generations. Uh, you also see equal um, uh, affection of males and females. Um, and the really important thing from a genetic standpoint is if you look and you sort of look at each person that has the disease, and that's the dark circles or dark squares, obviously, um, uh, you'll notice that about half of their kids on average end up having the disease. And that tells you that it's fairly penetrant disease. So that if you got the mutation, you probably got the disease. Maybe there's some different variable you know, severity um, that we see among families, but for the most part, um, you got, you know, you knew you had it. And, and that was, that was really important for doing genetics. All right. So I knew this wasn't urticaria. And so one of my first things to do was actually figure out how to classify this disease and then also how to, um, uh, how to name it. Cause the, the, the name that had been given over the years was a um, familial cold urticaria, which yeah, true. It is familial, um, clearly. Um, but it really isn't cold urticaria. So I, I sort of um, did a little bit of looking around to see if I figure out where this actually fit in better. And as an allergist immunologist, um, you guys are used to this concept that we end up seeing people on both sides of the immune spectrum where you have either not enough um, immune system, so you have immune deficiency, um, or you have too much inflammation. And obviously for us, it's allergies. For rheumatologists, it's autoimmunity. Um, but there is a new classification, not that new. It's now about almost 20 years old. Um, but it's called autoinflammation. And there's a really nice um, issue that I um, uh, guest edited back in 2020 that has a, several different um, articles that you, I'd sort of point your attention to that, um, that, that really focus on autoinflammation as well as a, a condition called hyperinflammation, um, which can result from lots of different immune dysregulation disorders. Um, and so this group of this sort of classification was created because of these three diseases. Um, and these diseases were, as Lynn mentioned, familial Mediterranean fever, um, which you know you had to memorize in medical school, but hardly anyone ever saw these patients unless you happen to be living in an area where there was a lot of them or just happened to randomly run into a patient. Um, Hyper IgD syndrome, also known as mevalonic kinase deficiency, um, and another condition that had originally been called autosomal dominant paroidic fever, but had been renamed to the tumor necrosis factor receptor associated paroidic syndrome, or TRAPS for short. So. Um, the, uh, um, these three diseases um, uh, were sort of known under the category of hereditary fever disorders, but they were all characterized by intermittent episodes of inflammation with some degree of um, free, symptom-free time. Um, all of them had some degree of fever, some musculoskeletal symptoms, some rash occasionally. All of them had evidence of systemic inflammation. Um, and so this is what the, um, because of these diseases, someone sort of had to give it a classification um, and so my thought was familial cold urticaria was actually familiar cold autoinflammatory syndrome, or we'll call it FCAS for short. Um, so 
Um, as I sort of mentioned, we're used to this sort of, you know, spectrum of things, but um, it's actually even a little bit more complicated, as you know, because um, you have these sort of, you know, three different types of inflammatory diseases, you have different types of um, immune deficiencies, but not everyone sort of goes right along these uh, spokes of the jack. Um, there are patients that can have autoimmunity and immune deficiency, as we all know. There are patients that can have allergic disease and um, immune deficiency. And there's clearly patients that can have autoinflammation and other inflammatory conditions or other immune deficiencies together. So it really is a whole category of immune dysregulation. It just means the immune system is out of whack. And most patients kind of, you know, some do fit very clearly on these, you know, on one of these particular things, but many actually kind of in between um, along somewhere along this sort of uh, big circle. All right, so the inflammatory diseases um, were sort of defined as these multisystemic inflammatory diseases, which are really not autoimmune allergic or immunodeficiency diseases, even though they had a lot of features of both autoimmune disease, um, like the joint pains, um, allergic disease, like the urticaria, and fevers, like you see in, um, you know, with infections and immune deficiency. Um, as I said, it was initially used to describe these few hereditary fever disorders, but now there are over 30 different rare monogenic disorders and also a fair number of um, complex diseases. And gout is certainly one of the most sort of famous of the ones that, that we'll talk about today. Um, in general, initially, those first few diseases that fell into this category were all driven by this one cytokine IL-1, and we'll talk a lot more about it. But now that we've sort of um, expanded the concept of autoinflammation, there are a number of different um, uh, um, uh, sort of mechanisms that drive inflammation, including the, the type one interferons, um, uh, as well as tumor necrosis factor and NF-kappa B. And then there are a number of other mechanisms that sort of uh, pop up, including things like complement, um, complement, which is sort of another innate immune um, uh, mechanism. And so all of these disorders are really innate immune driven. All right. so. The reason that these um, all of a sudden became interesting is in the late 1990s when I was sort of finishing my fellowship um, uh, and, and just uh, becoming a young faculty member, um, the genes for each of these different diseases was being nailed down one by one using these uh, pretty much mostly linkage analysis, kind of old school genetics. And so the gene for um, familiometrine fever um, became known as MEFV, which codes for a protein called pyrin. The, gene for um, hyper-IGD syndrome turned out to be a severe form. It turned out that mevalonic kinase, and that's a severe form of what we all know as mevalonic kinase deficiency, which gives you really severe um, neurologic disorder and, and, uh, and, and development delay. But those patients had a lot of inflammation that didn't really sort of come into it a lot. Um, and then lastly, um, this disorder that became um, known as TRAPS um, is due to mutations in the TNF receptor. And so I got this wild idea with no formal genetics training that I would try to find the gene for FCAS. Um, and so I just made it my life um, over the next year or so to just go around the country and meet as many patients as I could with this disease. Um, and these are the places where I went. Um, and uh, it was a little easier before 9-11 um, before to, to uh, make these trips and bring home um, suitcases full of blood. Um, but uh, Anyway, um, what you can see here from the map is that there are these large circles, which is greater than 10 patients concentrated in an area, the medium circles, which are somewhere between three and nine, and the small circles, which were one to two. Um, and the way this happened is I would sort of either get a referral from allergists around the country, because I sort of made it known through the academy that I was interested in these diseases, or I would talk to a family, and then they would say, you know, I have a family member, or I met someone randomly. And this was pretty much before internet. There was just, you know, there was starting to be a little bit of internet back then. Um, and, and they said, I met someone I think has the same disease. And while many of the patients they, you know, forwarded me to didn't have the disease, there were several that did. Um, the way I set it up is I would find a cheerleader that could get as many people or get along with as many people in their family as possible and get um, the, the families there in one place. I would fly out um, and uh, basically tell them what I'm doing, introduce myself, get a chance to talk to them and really understand the disease. They filled out questionnaires and things um, and then sign consent forms. And then I drew their blood and we had lunch. And that's kind of what I did on the road for about a year, year and a half or so, just to collect as many different samples as I could um, from these different families. Now, if you look at the map of where these families um, were, um, you do notice something interesting. Um, it does affect where they choose to live because most of the patients live in that sort of 
temperate, nice, you know, not too hot, not too cold region. There's some people that live in the slightly cooler region. You notice that really no one is living in the hottest parts of the country. And so I grew up in Houston, Texas. And the main reason that patients didn't live there is you can't live in those places like Florida, Texas, or even some of those areas um, in Arizona without having air conditioning. And air conditioning is really the, the, the bane of these people's existence. All right, so here are the first six pedigrees that we identified. The um, first one you've seen before, the other two are these, you know, again, large multi-generational um, uh, pedigrees. But if you look at families three, four, and five, you notice that there's a situation where neither of the parents had it. They gave it to one of their kids out of many, and then those, that person then passed it on. And I thought that was really weird, but that's exactly how autosomal dominant diseases start, is they, they get a mutation that happens and then pass it on to the rest of, um, of your family members. All right, long story short, we did find the gene. Um, I won't go through the, um, all the trials and tribulations of that, but the gene we ended up initially calling cold-induced autoinflammatory syndrome one or CIAS1. Um, that didn't work because it's got a CIA in it. Um, but NLRP3 is what the gene is now known now. And that's because there's a family of genes that all fit into this NLRs. Um, the protein we got to name, um, and we called it cryopyrin, um, because of the cold for cryo and the pyrin for fevers, and also the fact that it had a similar domain structure to the pyrin protein, which was seen in phenylmetronine and fever. And so it sort of brought these diseases together and that there actually was potentially some structural um, similarities. Most of mutations are located in this mid-region. There are some in other spots, and we can talk about that a little bit later. All right, so you found a gene. Um, uh, what's the big deal with that? Um, well, um, the other really cool thing about this um, uh, particular gene is it actually causes a couple other disorders. And so at the same time we were collecting patients with FCATs, we also collected a family with knuckle well syndrome. And this disease for all intents and purposes sounds exactly like FCATs. They have the same exact fever episodes, the same exact hives, the same exact joint symptoms, but they don't come to you saying cold is my biggest problem. They just say it happens. I don't know what happens. Sometimes it's stress. Maybe it's cold sometimes, maybe it's an infection. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, but really, if you listen to them, they all sound like a patient with FCATs, even to the point where they get worse in the evening and, and uh, afternoon and evening. But they also, um, with Michael Wilson, about a, um, two thirds of them will develop a sensory neural hearing loss that um, begins in adolescence and progresses to the point where they're deaf by adulthood. And about a third of them before treatment would get this um, disease called amyloidosis, which is from chronic inflammation, chronic buildup of amyloid in different tissues, particularly kidneys. And so many ended up um, on dialysis or um, needing a transplant um, at, at some point. And then lastly, there was another disease um, that had um, people had sort of talked about as having some connections with Michael Wells syndrome. Um, and this condition known as neonatal onset multisystem inflammatory disease, again, if you really look at it, had the exact same features of Michael Wells and FCAS, but was much, much more severe and much, much more chronic. It really, there wasn't much of an intermittent nature to it. Um, they had the hearing loss, but they also had much more severe CNS inflammation, and they also had dysmorphic features as well. Um, so turns out that all three of these different diseases are due to um, mutations in LRP3. And so we call this a spectrum of disorders called the cryopyrinopathies or the cryopyrin associated periodic syndromes, with FCAS being the intermediate, uh, FCAS being the mild, Michael Wells being intermediate, and NOMAD being the most severe. All right, the other cool thing about having um, finding a gene is this. Why rash again? It went away. It's a reason to come back. He said he was cold, but it's always freezing in there. I'm guessing you guys can hear this. Cold and rash. Cold urticaria causes rash, but it's almost instantaneous, not time delayed. And it wouldn't explain his other symptoms. That's what we did. Made him cold. Caps. Genetic disorder caused by a mutation in the cold induced auto inflammatory syndrome one gene. Muckle Well syndrome? It's only been a couple thousand documented cases in the US. Well, now there's a couple of thousand and one. So I was the um, medical consultant for this episode um, back in like 2009 or 10. Um, I would not recommend watching it. It's completely inaccurate. But that, that, few, that few seconds there was a partly accurate. Um, all right, let's move on. So there are now, um, out, over the, after the first few mutations we identified, uh, we continue to find more mutations and then other, other folks around the world got involved in this disease. And there's now over 90 different pathogenic mutations in this gene. Um, and uh, if you look at, at, um, at the color coding here, you see that 
um, there's actually what's called pretty good genotype phenotype correlation, which means if you have a particular mutation, I can pretty much pinpoint where you're gonna be on that spectrum. Now there's some complicating issues. This is the spectrum of disease. And so there are some mutations like the purple ones here that you see on the left that are purple, um, that, that can be seen in both FCAS and Marker Wells, or actually can be seen in a patient that kind of has features of both and kind of is in between that. Um, and then there's these brown ones here, like you'll see in the middle or all around, that actually can be seen in sort of more severe Marker Wells or mild, no, milder nomic patients. Um, that's, and that's what you would expect with the spectrum of disease, is you sort of fit all the way sort of along the spectrum. There's also a couple of black ones in here, and those are actually what are called low penetrance mutations or low penetrance variants. Um, and those are, interesting um, uh, because occasionally they can give you a disease that looks just like CAPS. Occasionally they can give you absolutely nothing. And occasionally they give you something that looks a little bit different than CAPS. Um, and, uh, and that's something we end up uh, doing a lot, lot of work on and still trying to figure out the best way to deal with those patients. All right, um, there's a lot of complexity. As I mentioned, the low penetrance variants are one of them, uh, but there's also patients that have a classic phenotype for FCAS, but don't have a mutation. Um, over the years, there have now been four different um, genes, including a couple we've been involved with, that actually also have colon-induced urticarial rashes. Um, a couple of them are actually NLRs, and we'll talk about at least one, one of those later. Um, one of them is, uh, is a, a disease that we initially called um, familial atypical cold urticaria that then turned out to be, um, have mutations in the phospholipase C gamma 2 gene. Um, those patients also have immune deficiency. Um, and, uh, and then there's a, a more recent one due to factor 12. And factor 12 is known for its hereditary angioedema, um, sort of type three hereditary angioedema, uh, but it also can, can lead to this um, from, uh, factor 12 associated cold induced autoinflammatory syndrome one, or cold, cold inflammatory sy syndrome. Anyway, um, there are also still patients out there that we see that have good histories, but don't match for any of these disease, diseases uh, or gene, disease genes. And there's also some patients that have late onset disease that show up as adults, um, which doesn't seem like you would see with a, 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 a genetic disease. And the reason for that is there are several patients that have this thing called somatic mosaicism. Normally when we have a mutation, it either comes from your mom or your dad and gets in, uh, in the sperm or the egg. You can also potentially have a mutation that happens in the sperm or the egg. Um, uh, and, uh, and then that leads to every one of your cells having that particular mutation. But you can also have a mutation that develops later on in development after the sperm and egg get together and you have in the embryonic stage. And depending on where and when that happens and which cells the mutation starts up in, it, you can end up with a very small percentage of one particular type of cell with that mutation. And that's exactly what happens in CAPS and that there are patients with as few as 4% of their myeloid cells. Um, so they're innate immune cells that actually have that mutation and they still have full-blown disease or sometimes they develop it later onset. All right, so what does cryopyrin do? Um, so as I mentioned, it's a member of this family of uh, nod-like receptors, um, and these are all intracellular sensors of pathogens and danger signals. Um, they are sort of known as like intracellular or cytoplasmic toll-like receptors, which are these, again, innate immune receptors. And they all have this kind of structure where they have an effector, a switch, and a sensor that kind of um, uh, you know, make, make the protein work and do what it does. Um, in the particular case of NLRP3, it has a pyrin domain, it has a nod domain, and it has its LRR domain, and so it's called NLRP, and it's the third of these particular ones. There's also uh, a CAR domain, so you can have these, um, these uh, proteins called NLRCs, and we'll talk about one a little bit later. And here's sort of what happens when, um, when this all comes together, is the, these, um, this sensor comes together with um, these adapter proteins and these effector proteins, and we'll talk about those, caspase one is one of them, um, and then that effector protein gets active, cleaved and activated and then results in um, some inflammatory processes by um, cleaving procytokines and also cell death um, by activating this pore that allows the cytokines to come out. So here's another video just so you can see sort of what's happening in, in, uh, in better, better, um, better views. So I'm imagining you guys are all seeing this, let me know if you're not. Um, but what's going on inside the cell is you have these inactive NLRP3s um, and so most of us who have normal NLRP3 have this sort of closed up NLRP3. Now, if you happen to um, get a stress signal, um, or if you have a mutation, you're basically wide open or sort of more easily um, opened. And once act NLRP3 becomes active and um, has this sort of open conformation, it then allows it to oligomerize. In other words, it comes together with a bunch of other um, cryopyrins or NLRP3s. 
Um, and it forms this absolutely beautiful structure called the inflammasome, um, which uh, was described a few years after we identified um, NLRP3, which has been an amazing um, thing for us. The pyrin domains are what actually puts it together. That's the disc in the center. Um, and once these form this, um, this whole sort of complex, um, then it starts to recruit these adapter proteins. And the, the big one is called ASC. Um, and ASC forms these long polymers, um, these long sort of strings, um, uh, just by sort of getting together and self oligomerizing with the pyrin um, domains of the, of the cryopyrin protein. Um, and you get these sort of long um, helical filaments. Once um, ASC forms these filaments, it then attracts these effector proteins, caspase 1. And caspase 1 then comes in um, by and attaches through its card domain with the, the ASC card domain. And these um, caspase 1s all um, connect and then are cleaved. And then you have active caspase 1 that then starts, um, starts this whole cascade of things. Because this active caspase 1 then can leave um, and, um, and then start to cleave pro cytokines like pro IL-1 beta and pro um, IL-18. And once they're cleaved and activated, they can then do what they've got to do and they can also leave the cell. And the way they leave the cell is it also turns out that AS, uh, that, that caspase one also cleaves this, um, uh, uh, this protein called gas dermin. And once it does that, um, it, uh, it then can allow things to leave the cell. Now, um, it is interesting, caspase one has a sort of natural way to turn itself off as well. And so it actually can sort of switch itself off. And that's what we just saw there. Um, anyway, as we get gas dermin D um, fragments uh, that have been cleaved, they all form together in these little pores. And once these pores um, uh, 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 develop on the, on the cell of the membrane, um, you then can get the cytokines to get through those pores. But you also get this osmotic swelling of the cell um, and because of all this different ion transfer and the cell then bursts. And that's a process called pyroptosis, which is basically inflammasome mediated cell death. Um, so that's what cryopyrin does. Um, I think we can, oh, and then um, it has a way to clean itself out. Um, so all, once the cell is all dead, phagocytes come to the site and then come eat. And you'll see them sort of clean up um, the situation right here. And so it's a way of a native immune system to sort of activate and then kind of relax itself again. And that's something important about the innate immune system. All right, let's see here. Let me go back to this. Are we, am I on? Are you guys seeing this? Or did I mess it up? I think it's working, right? Let me know. Yeah, I, we still, I see your slides. Okay, great. Um, all right, super. Uh, let me, pop. okay, so here's um, a little more boring um, uh, uh, structure, but you see cryopyrin sort of forming all these, forming this complex. Caspase one then cleaves and then cleaves the in interleukins and then the interleukin, it also cleaves gas germ D and forms the pore and then IL-1 leads the cell. And then IL-1 can bind to receptors on all kinds of other cells leading to an inflammatory cascade, but also can even bind to the receptors in the same cell and lead to then activation through the nf -kappa b process to make more pro IL-1 beta and pro IL-18. Um, and then that can then lead to more, this auto-inflammatory process of more IL-1 being released, but also can lead to a number of other cytokines being released like IL-6, IL-17, and TNF. All right, so that's the inflammasome. Uh, oh, and then I mentioned the pyroptotic cell death. Turns out, um, as you heard, that NLRP3 is not just important for these rare diseases, it also um, is important for all of us. Um, uh, it turns out the NLRP3 inflammasome is activated by a number of different crystals like urate crystals, which are responsible for gout, cholesterol crystals, which are important in atherosclerosis, and silica and asbestos, which are important for those lung diseases, occupational lung diseases we have to learn about. Um, and also it's important in the pathogen recognition process. Um, and so uh, important, particularly for strep and staph. All right, how do all these different things activate the inflammasome? There's a lot of theories about it. Um, the biggest one now is sort of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species, because these inflammasomes seem to go to the mitochondria and are activated on that, on that platform. And that's sort of where, where things happen. All right, so we had this sort of um, idea that came up about what the inflammasome did. And so we wanted to test and see if that made sense. And so we can actually take cells from our patients and give them just a teeny little bit of LPS and they release lots of IL-1. So they're sort of hyperactivated. As I mentioned, they have this sort of hyperactivated NLRP3s. The other really interesting thing is if we take patients with FCAS 
and and uh, and allow the cells to sit uh, on and on the plastic and, and then isolate just adherent monocytes. If we take those cells and stick them in 32 degrees instead of 37 degrees, they release a lot of IL-1 that you don't see in regular cells, and then you don't see at 37 degrees. Um, so these, the, it really seems like this sort of pathway is making sense. Um, all right, so we wanted to also see if that worked in terms of our um, patients. And so we um, set up a cold challenge model and that was me surfing in La Jolla. Temperature right now is 53 degrees down here. It's record lows, it's really cold. Um, that's why I'm going to Nicaragua. Um, all right, so um, we had this pathway. We could think about targeting it. Um, one way would be to target sort of the things that trigger the inflammasome. One would be to target the inflammasome itself, either uh, NLRP3 or other proteins. One would be to target caspase-1, and there are some drugs out there that, um, that were already doing that. Um, it didn't work out because they required high dosing and weren't really that effective. Um, you could also try to target that gastrin D I talked about that allows the IL-1 and, and IL-18 to leave the cell. Or you could target IL-1 directly or the IL-1 receptor directly, and we'll talk about those drugs. Or you could go downstream of the IL-1 receptor to those NF-kappa-B-like proteins that then lead to more cytokine expression. Um, or you could target sort of downstream. Anyway, it turned out for, uh, for our benefit, um, anakinra was already available. And anakinra is a recombinant protein that we all have. Um, it's just they made one recombinant. And this protein is the IL-1 receptor antagonist. And it is basically one of the ways the innate immune system that's activated by IL-1 relaxes because basically it competes with IL-1 for the receptor and keeps all that inflammation from happening. This had been tried in sepsis back in the 80s and 90s and uh, worked in a subgroup of patients, but didn't get, ever get approved for sepsis like most things never do, but did get approved for rheumatoid arthritis because it helped uh, um, some people. It wasn't really being used much um, but we were able to bring our patients in for a cold challenge. And every time we would do this cold challenge, they would have symptoms. When we brought them in, this time we actually gave them a couple doses of anakinra before we put them in the cold challenge. And instead of getting a rash like they got every time, instead of getting a high white count like they got every time, instead of just feeling miserable, they actually had no symptoms at all for the next um, 48 hours, which was really remarkable for these patients. So that ended up leading to... Um, uh, approval of Anakinra for at least some of the CAPS um, subforms. And also these other companies came in that had other IL-1 blockers, one called Relonacept made by Regeneron. Um, and that um, drug is a sort of a fusion protein that binds to IL-1. Um, and then Canakinumab is a um, monoclonal antibody that binds to IL-1 beta. Um, and all of these drugs now have been approved for um, caps um, uh, over, you know, over a few year process. It actually happened really rapidly because of the orphan disease drug. All right, so this is really an example of bench to bedside and back where we started with these patients, we found the gene, we worked with a lot of other people to figure out the pathways, and then we used that um, to figure out what drugs to apply to the patients. And in this situation, we just repurposed another drug and ended up treating the same patients that we started with. All right, um, there are some treatment issues. All of these drugs are injectable. Um, and some of them actually have some pretty bad uh, injection site reactions. Um, and a lot of patients really don't like taking shots. Um, uh, there is an issue. Um, uh, IL-1 is important in fighting infections, particularly strep and staph. Um, and so we do see sort of non-opportunistic infections in patients on uh, some of the patients on IL-1 inhibitors. These drugs are all biologics um, and all were sort of approved under orphan disease drugs. So they are extremely expensive. Um, one thing we've seen now that we've been doing this for 10 or 15 years is we do see some patients requiring increased doses. Um, and all along, we've seen some patients that didn't have a, a complete um, response. Um, all right, so where are we headed with future therapies? Um, as we mentioned, there are you know, a lot of different ways to look at this pathway. Um, one of the ways would be downstream of the IL-1 receptor, and there's a bunch of um, companies that are working on drugs to target that pathway. Um, that's downstream of the IL-1 receptor, things like MAP kinases, you know, kappa B, different you know, kappa Bs, and, um, uh, even IRAC4, um, which is um, downstream of the IL-1 receptor. And so we've done a little bit of work um, with, uh, with some of those and actually showed that they do actually reduce um, IL-1R signaling in this sort of human assay, where we take the cells out and then sit, hit them with just a little bit of LPS, as I, as I showed you before. All right, um, but the real focus nowadays has been on um, targeting NLRP3. And there are now 10 different companies that are working on these drugs. And they're assuming these drugs are going to be used for everything, um, uh, as NLRP3 seems to be involved in so many diseases, as I'll show you in a second. Um, and so we've been working with some of those drugs in our 
patients' uh, blood cells, and we actually can show that it works. And we had some concern that it may not, because these drugs are designed to hit NLRP3, but they're designed to hit normal NLRP3, not mutant NLRP3. Um, it turns out they don't work as well in our mutant patient, in our mutant cells, but they work. Um, maybe a little bit less effective, but they still work. And so we're looking forward to seeing how these are going. There's a couple trials going on now in, in patients with CAPS. Um, so they could have an oral drug um, in the near future. All right. So there, as, I, as we talked about, um, there are other NLRs um, and there are other proteins that actually form inflammasomes. And so um, one, the first inflammasome that was ever fully described was the NLRP1 inflammasome. Um, it's triggered by things like anthrax. Um, NLRP3, we talked about all the different things that, um, that trigger it. There's also an inflammasome called NLRC4, which can be triggered by um, a few different bacterial um, things like flagellin and bacterial secretion systems. We'll talk about NLRC4 in a second. There's also another um, protein that forms an inflammasome that's not an NLR. It's called an AIM2, and it's activated by cytoplasmic DNA, sort of like the sting pathway. Um, and then, as we talked about, good old FMF, which is caused by uh, mutations in the pyrin protein, um, also forms an inflammasome. And it turns out it actually is um, specific for certain pathogen um, processes. And probably the reason we, um, there is some selection for, um, for this is, is actually because of um, the plague for, for Yersinia, because this, this particular inflammasome is important in, in, um, in your response to, to Yersinia. All right, well, we talked about NLRP3 and how it's seen in CAPS. There are also a few Schnitzler patients that, um, central disease patients that actually have mutations in LRP3. That's sort of controversial at this time. As we talked about, pyrin is due to mutations in FMF. We're gonna talk a little bit about this NLRC4 uh, mutation. There is also some patients that have NLRP1 um, uh, diseases. Um, and then there's uh, no, no mutations that have been described in AIM2 yet. So we're, we're sort of just waiting. All right, we'll talk a little bit about a few of these and then um, we'll wrap up for, um, for some questions. Um, FMF, um, as you all remember, um, is more common in certain populations. Um, in certain populations, it's actually up to 20% of the population is a carrier. Um, it's usually um, thought of as an autosomal recessive disease, but actually we now know that there are dominant um, families and there are patients that have classic FMF that only have one mutation. So um, we'll talk about why that is. Um, uh, the episodes are uh, last about one to three days. Um, the symptoms uh, can be really severe abdominal pain or chest pain. They often can get this joint um, monoarthritis and get this um, uh, erysipelas like rash on the ankles. Um, for these patients, they kind of got lucky back, um, uh, back in the 70s. Uh, one was being treated for gout and actually his FMF got better. And so then there was trials to sort of um, show that it worked. And so most patients actually respond really well to just daily um, dosing of colchicine which actually prevents their attacks and also prevents their development of amyloidosis, which, which can happen. Um, so as I mentioned, pyrin also forms an inflammasome, similar to what we see with NLRP3. And pyrin also has these gain of function mutations um, that then lead to caspase-1 and IL-1 beta. Um, and so uh, it actually turns out that, um, that these uh, disorders are also treated with, um, if you don't respond to colchicine, you actually can be treated with an IL-1 inhibitor. Um, and so there actually have been now IL-1 um, trials in, with many of the drugs in TRAPS, in colchicine-resistant FMF patients, and in the HIDS patients. And so canakinumab was approved um, in 2017 uh, for these three diseases. Um, so IL-1 turned out to be important for all of these different um, hereditary fever disorders that we talked about in the beginning. All right, so, but it's not all about IL-1. As I mentioned, there's another cytokine that inflammasomes um, uh, cleave and activate, and that's IL-18. And so there is this one disease due to mutations in NLRC4, which leads in one, in, in a few cases to patients with FCAS-like um, syndrome, um, which was described in 2014, but um, more commonly is um, described in these patients that have a much more severe form where they have macrophage activation syndrome and really severe GI involvement, because it turns out NLRC4 is involved and is expressed in, in, the, in the gut. And so these patients end up with really bad um, GI symptoms. Uh, and and um, uh, oftentimes will be in, in the intensive care unit. Um, so uh, here's the NLRC4 um, uh, um, inflammasome. It also has gain of function mutations in it. And also instead of leading to, it does lead to IL-1 release. And we do treat these patients with IL-1 blockers as well, but they also need blocking of their IL-18 to get full control of their disease. 
And there's one drug that's being studied called IL-18 binding protein, which actually binds to IL-18 and just like the IL-1 receptor antagonist, keeps it from getting to the receptor. Um, there's also some IL-18 antibodies that are being looked at as well in these, in these patients. All right, so in case all these sort of auto-inflammatory diseases confuse you, I do wanna to refer to you to this really nice um, search engine. I, I don't think it's ever gonna take away the doctor but, um, uh, or, or us experts, but it actually works really well. If you take a patient that you see that you think has a flavor of auto-inflammation and you type in their symptoms, it will spit out the diseases that actually are most likely to be the ones you should be thinking about. Um, and so uh, it's at the Auto-Inflammatory Alliance, it's called Auto-Inflammatory Search. Um, and, uh, and it goes through this database that's actually really nicely put together by, uh, by several families and physicians. All right, what about common diseases? Why should you care about this besides these rare diseases that you may never see? Well, as we mentioned, I mean, uh, you know, urate crystals activate things. Um, there's also pseudo gout. There's also those lung diseases. There's also atherosclerosis. Um, and those are all sort of been hypothesized to be NLRP3 mediated because those all activate the inflammasome. And there's all really strong mouse evidence and potentially also some human cell evidence to suggest that these things are going to work. And, and actually, IL-1 inhibitors have been used in gout effectively. Um, and there's a big trial of an IL-1 inhibitor in atherosclerosis that actually did show um, a positive result. We can talk about that later. Um, but there's also a, a role in a lot of other diseases, including some rare diseases, Kawasaki disease. Um, there's clearly a role for NLRP3 in that, um, based on mouse models and also based on some other studies. And there's an Anakinra trial going on in uh, Kawasaki disease patients um, that actually shows it to be um, effective in many of these patients. Um, it can also be used in, um, in renal failure. Um, we, we know there's a role for NLRP3 in, in, uh, in kidney function, but also in the cachexia that you get from that. And, uh, and there's potential talk, and there's actually some trials being planned for anakinra and potentially NLRP3 inhibitors in chronic renal failure. There's also a rare disease called nephropathic cystinosis that also um, could be treated uh, with some of these drugs. BPD, which as pediatricians, we all had to run into during the NICU, um, NLRP3 has been implicated in this, and there are trials going around uh, in, in different sites around the country in uh, NICUs um, for BPD with anakinra. Um, Non-alcoholic or NASH, um, uh, NLRP3 clearly has a role there, and there are companies that are designing their drugs to try to go into patients um, with these liver diseases to try to help that. Um, neurodegenerative diseases, NLRP3 seems to have a role in uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, and so a lot of people are trying to design these NLRP3 um, inhibitors that actually go into the brain and would focus on, on these particular areas. As I mentioned, it's also important in, uh, in infections, so group A strep, we know um, uh, we saw that in the anakinra um, uh, trials in, in, or in the IL-1 blocker trials and also in anakinra where they seem to get more strep. Um, and so we know there's a role there. And we're actually also studying the role of IL-1 and LRP3 in valley fever, which um, uh, probably you don't see much in Seattle, but um, uh, we get some down here in the, um, in the deserts. All right, so as I mentioned, Resource Auto-Inflammatory Alliance is a good place to go for all your information. There's some tables in that search. Orphanet's another one. Um, there's also a really nice um, registry of all the mutations in case you get some results back and you want to figure out what other people have found with those mutations. Um, in fevers is there for you. Um, so the take-home messages are these auto-inflammatory diseases or a new group of disorders. Inflammasomes are these intracellular um, multiprotein complexes. IL-1 targeted therapy works, um, but inflammasome targeted therapy is on its way. So uh, um, here's all the different people that have helped them. Um, my funding sources over the years had a lot of different um, uh, med students, undergraduates, residents, fellows that have worked on this project as well as all the families and collaborators. And then I can't leave you without showing you this. Um, this is your code word. Um, so uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, let me escape that. And see you well, thank you, that was uh, brilliant. Uh an amazing amount of information in just 45 minutes. Um, one very basic question, why is cold, how does cold stimulate the process? How does it initiate an inflammasome? And that was the reason I got into this from the beginning. I was always curious how cold stimulated, um, you know, mast cells to cause or to carry. And that was my right. initial thought was, you know, what is it about cold that does this? Um, I still don't think we exactly know how cold triggers um, mast cells. We do know mast cells are kind of twitchy and, and, and lots of different things can trigger them, but we still don't really know the mechanism for that, although there's a lot of hypotheses for it. And I've spent the last several years trying to figure out what it is about cold that actually triggers um, 
triggers caps. Um, a couple of things that, that I, I think, uh, you know, a couple hypotheses I had that I think have been disproven. Um, my initial thought was this would be a great way to understand the neuro and immune connections because nerves are really good at detecting, you know, temperature. That's, you know, we, we learned a lot more about that. Actually, the Nobel Prize was given to the guy that figured out those receptors. Um, and so I thought this was going to be a great way to sort of understand how the nervous system and the immune system work out and the nerves would detect a cold that would activate the immune system. But that kind of got disproven when I was able to take monocytes, you know, straight immune cells from my patients and just stick them in a dish and give them a little bit of cold and they reacted. So the nervous system is clearly not going on there. So it really is a direct effect. And so I had a number of different ideas. Um, one was um, these uh, TRP channels, which are the, um, again, the Nobel Prize was one for these things. It's, it's the menthol feeling. It's um, that sort of, uh, and, and these are all on nerves that actually allow you to detect different temperatures. Um, and it turns out those TRP channels are actually on monocytes. Um, so we looked at that. We looked at it with the guy actually, Artem, that won the Nobel Prize. And we actually couldn't ever prove that the TRPs were actually involved in, in the process at all. But I'm not sure we totally disproved it. Another theory um, was um, there are these things called heat shock proteins, which we know bind to the um, NLRP3 inflammasome. And there's also these things called cold shock proteins. And they're sometimes actually the same thing, really. Um, and these are stabilizing proteins that sort of help um, proteins kind of get together and get sticky. Um, and we actually did show that if you block certain heat, um, heat shock proteins, you can actually block the inflammasome response to cold. Um, but we could never really prove it. Um, it turns out that um, it probably is these heat shock proteins, but it also is more involved in, in just how these proteins get together. And, 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 and as you saw, you know, there's an inactive form and an active form. And so just having those little mutations, and, and this is what you see in flies and worms and all kinds of different cold you know, phenotypes, it is just a slight mutation that actually changes the protein conformation and makes it, like in this case, probably a little bit more active, a little bit more open. Um, so that's kind of where we are. There's a couple of papers that are, um, that are, have, uh, are coming out, have, have come out on some of the other um, NLRC4 um, that are showing these, uh, that mechanism as being the thing that does it. But um, it, it's exciting to, to sort of see how it's all coming together after 20 years of doing this. Um, I'll open it up to anybody, but I was just curious, at what point in your career were you when you traveled around the country and found families and who paid for all of that? <laughs> well, so um, uh, I was fortunate um, uh, in that I applied during my third and fourth year of well, third year of fellowship, um, uh, I applied for a K08 award um, to find the gene and actually got it the first time, which I never expected because I'd never written, I'd written a couple of little grants, but nothing like that before. And I had no genetics experience, but I did have some good genetics helping me. Um, and, uh, and so I actually ended up uh, doing a remedial year of fellowship so I could kind of keep doing this um, and, uh, and, and was still supported on, on an NIH T32 right before I, I got the K08. Um, so it was NIH that actually supported it. Um, it didn't end up being that expensive. It was easier to travel back then. And, uh, and I was, you know, usually in and out pretty quick because um, I needed to get the blood back to the lab so I could get DNA from that blood. Um, but, uh, and they all, and they all supplied lunch. So, uh, so that, that made it easy. Um, but yeah, it was sort of in the end of my fellowship um, and that sort of transition to young faculty um, where I, uh, I did all that traveling. Uh, well, fantastic. Um, others out there, we've got uh, a healthy audience listening to you. Yeah, you can use the chat if you'd like, if you're not comfortable talking. Um, I've got the chat, op chat open if you have a question there. Do you, uh, who are your colleagues in this field in Seattle? I, I haven't, you know, I don't know much about these diseases as a traditional allergist. Uh, and so, who, who has expertise up in Seattle in this in yeah. this disease area? Glad you asked that. I think um, I think most in most places it's the rheumatologists who are interested in these diseases, and mostly it's pediatric rheumatologists, even though these you know diseases you know last into adulthood. Um, and so there are a few people um, at um, Children's in uh, in Seattle um, who actually do know a lot about um, the uh, the autoinflammatory diseases. Um, I still think it's important for allergists to know about these diseases because they show up, um, you know, particularly the, the FCAS patients because of the cold induced stuff. And we're, you know, we, we are constantly seeing patients with recurrent fevers as, as immunologists, 
Um, and, uh, and it's important to know, know about these different disorders. So I actually have made it a big point to actually make sure allergists are aware of it. I definitely share these patients with my rheumatology colleagues because um, they're, um, you know, they're really helpful and they are, they are comfortable with some of these medicines and, uh, and know it. So I think that's always good to sort of work with them. But I also think allergists are right there in the front to, to be able to know what these uh, diseases are, are doing. Um, as an allergist, we also see a lot of patients with non-genetic um, periodic fevers. Um, the most common thing we see in our recurrent fever clinic that's part of our allergy division is uh, um, a condition called periodic fever aptostomatitis pharyngitis adenitis syndrome. Um, and that particular disease shows up in kids between the age two and five, and they get these clock-like fevers up to 100 and 607 with um, pharyngitis, uh, adenitis, and aptus ulcers. Um, and, uh, and we end up seeing a bunch of those patients as allergists um, because the infectious disease doctors say it's not an infection, rheumatologists say it's not autoimmune. So it's gotta be some, something that you immunologists can deal with. Just, just to add a word there. So Eric Allensbach, who, who I think most people on this call will know, uh, who trained in both uh, rheumatology and AI uh, with me and David Hagen and others. So he's the go-to, I think, in the area. He's not doing all the clinical time, but um, he's my point of contact. Um, so, uh, yeah, and he works you know, with the whole children's rheumatology group on this. Yeah, and I think that's a great combination, both allergy and rheum. I think you can really, then you really get the whole immune dysregulation spectrum. So um, that's unique training. You know, the, um, it strikes me there are a lot of similarities between this and hereditary angioedema, which is also a real strength in UC San Diego with your colleagues and friends down there. Autosomal dominant with uh, spontaneous mutations. Um, is that teaching us anything? I, I think so. Interestingly, the the um, the reason one of the reasons I also got involved in this um, was a guy named Alan Wanderer who um, who ended up uh, who was a in, in Colorado and then in Montana for a while, um, and he had done some work on cold urticaria and on uh, on this. And he actually told me when I you know was showing him we were talking about the genetics, and he was like, you know, this is this is going to turn out to be just like hereditary angioedema, you're going to find a gene, and you're going to be able to find treatments for it. And he called that like 20, you know, more than 25 years ago. Um, I, actually, you know, the hereditary angioedema folks don't like to, don't like to admit it, but that's actually an auto-inflammatory disease too. It's really just complement, you know, the whole complement contact system being dysregulated, which is part of the innate immune system. And, you know, you just target different things. And interestingly, that one disease I mentioned, uh, which is called FACUS or um, factor 12 associated cold auto-inflammatory syndrome um, requires treatment with both IL-1 inhibitors and bradykinin inhibitors. Um, so there's clearly, you know, overlap and connections with that. And I, I, I think, um, you know, they're rare autosomal dominant diseases. So um, clearly there's a connection there. I, I call them auto-inflammatory, although I've spoken at a few hereditary angioedema meetings and it's not been widely accepted. I think they'd like to consider themselves alone. So... Uh, let's see, we've got a chat question here. I don't know if you see it. I, well, it disappeared on my screen. Yeah, you see I it? Say, um, yeah. and so the question from uh, Vinod is, is there data or studies on the role of inflammasome with COVID? And yeah, there definitely are some studies. We're actually hoping to do um, some mouse studies very soon as we finally got our BSL-3 up and running and we have our mice that are, um, our knockout mice that are ready to go. But yeah, there's um, looking at expression um, data there is evidence for a role for NLRP3 um, in, uh, in inflammasome, either non-canonical or canonical inflammasomes in COVID and then potentially also in some of the long, you know, long COVID or MISC or, or, or things like that. Um, and, and definitely um, there are IL-1 blockers have been used in, in COVID disease and COVID related diseases with some success. And there's an NLRP3 trial that has been going on, NLRP3 inhibitor trial that's been going on in COVID. It was a way for these companies to get their drug out there and try it. Don't know the results of that. I'm not sure if it was, I think we had heard if it was like absolutely magical, um, but I think it, it, um, there, there's clearly a role for, um, for these diseases in that. Interestingly, we, we were really expecting a, a horrible situation in, with COVID and, and our autoinflammatory sy syndrome patients, because here are these patients with you know, active innate immune systems that are just waiting to be, you know, and we know that infections can trigger them. 
Um, and we were also worried about vaccines because sometimes vaccines can trigger them. So this was this big fear that all of us in the inflammatory community were that COVID was just gonna be a disaster for us. And it turned out not to be a disaster for potentially several reasons. One, um, a lot of these patients are on IL-1 inhibitors, which turned out to be a good thing because I think it prevented them from having the inflammatory effects. Um, and uh, the other thing is I had patients, you know, that, that actually had COVID and it was just like the rest of us, kind of um, not that bad, um, you know, for, for many different patients. Um, uh, you know, it certainly can happen, you know, for, for some patients with, with, um, with problems, but they, they ended up being, act, being more like sort of, you know, regular things. And it turns out that actually my FCAS patients, when I talked to them on these reunions, they would tell me that they never had colds, sinus infections, ear infections growing up. Their other siblings would get them, but they would, you know, they obviously had all their horrible rashes and joint um, symptoms and things like that, that um, and fevers, but they hardly ever got colds. So it's possible that sort of having an active inflammasome kind of protects you from certain types of fever, viral or bacterial infections. Once these patients went on IL-1 inhibitors, um, that's when they would sometimes start getting the normal colds and stuff that you know every, everyone gets. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I think there, there's clearly a role there. Are there any screening labs for these diseases or is measuring IL-1 or NLRP3 useful? Um, great question. In general, measuring IL-1 is not useful. Um, it does show up on some of the new cytokine panels that people are offering, different labs are offering. I actually don't find those to be very useful, particularly IL-1. I, I look for IL-1 in my patients after the cold challenge and look for IL-1 in patients who are flaring and you just don't see it. Um, you either need a really sensitive test or it's bound to something so it's not getting picked up in sort of typical ELISAs. Um, you can look at NLRP3 expression, but it's not really that useful. Um, so honestly, for most of these diseases, we go straight to genetics. Um, and, uh, and genetics uh, you know, has gotten a lot more affordable and a lot more easy. We end up using uh, uh, several of the different um, companies that actually have these self-pay options. So you don't have to battle with the insurance company for you know, so they can charge the thousands of dollars and then, you know, deny it and make the patient pay a copay of, you know, almost a thousand dollars. A lot of these companies will offer as low as 200 or, you know, three or $400 um, to do an entire panel of 400 genes, um, which gives you all kinds of information. It also gives you a lot of, you know, red herrings too, that you got to sort of deal with, but that's how we, we usually go straight to genetics. I mean, honestly, for many of my patients, I actually do, um, you know, I can tell by history um, for CAPS patients for the most part, but I'll still do genetics to sort of confirm it. So um, let's see, uh, may I ask you which mouse strain you're using, which forms of the virus are you using for the human strain <laughs> um, does not affect, and do you hypothesize that these mice will look like bats where LMP3 is really not existing? <laughs> yeah, those are good questions. Um, I guess the mouse model that we're, um, uh, that a lot of people were using is the mouse model that has the human ACE in it. Um, but we're actually able to use, I, I actually don't know the specifics about which, um, which process we're gonna be doing because I'm doing a collaboration with someone else, but uh, they have it working. So uh, I, yeah, I that was Sorry to interrupt, but that was our issue. We were using the ACE2 model and it, yeah, we were having a lot of trouble because we were trying to form an anti-ACE2 um, right. IgG, yeah. Uh, that that um that's what I've heard of, but I, I I'm not exactly sure what the plan is. But we're going to be able to do it with C57s, is what everyone. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, Hal, thank you for a brilliant presentation. Um, it's the kind of thing that since we don't see these diseases, uh, we'll forget what you taught us and have to have you do it again in a year or so. Happy to do it. I always like talking about these diseases and, and you'd be surprised. I give a talk like this and then I get a call a few months later going, you know what? I never thought I would see one of these patients, but I just did. So uh, looking forward to hearing from you guys. All right. Well, hopefully a year from now or so you can come in person. Sounds good. I would love that. It's great. All to right. Do. Take care. Enjoy your surfing. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.